So I'm just starting the recording there. Uh, <clears throat> so in this first example here, for everyone watching the recording, the first little bit was just going over being um, introducing the three measures of central tendency, and now we're just going to do this first example on how to calculate mean. Um, so what do we do for this one? And if you don't want to actually write, because I find a lot of people just are like, well, what's the point of rewriting all the numbers? I'm okay if you do this. Plus, plus, plus. Put a plus sign in between all of them. That's really what you're doing. You're adding them all up. So first, we're going to find the sum of all the data. So 1 plus 4 plus 2 plus 10 plus 6 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3. What does that give? Yes, okay. Sir? 35, right? Okay, perfect. And obviously we have 10 of them. And it's always a good idea. I'm, I'm going to start using the location a little bit more. So n is just refers to how many pieces of data we have. We have 10 pieces of data. So that means that our mean is going to be, yeah, yeah, you got it. 35 divided by 10, which is 3.5, exactly. And then when you find your mean, the good thing about finding mean is that a lot of times in math, you're not sure if it's correct or not. Um, with mean, median, and mode, I would say, um, all three, you can always look back at your data and try, just try to look at it, even just quickly. Ask yourself, does that make sense as an answer? So my smallest value is 1. My largest value is 10. And most of my values seem to be in the lower end, right? Most of them do. So it kind of makes sense, just even looking at it really briefly, that 3.5 would be the accurate answer for the mean. Anyone curious, how many, what's the average number of kids people have, at least in North America? Anyone know? Or anyone want to take a guess? Yeah? I, I think, and you know, you can, you can Google, because unfortunately I can't check here, um, but I'm pretty sure it is above two. But you're really close, like so 1.7, it's like two points, it's a decimal. Although it could have, it could be 1.7 though. Anyone, can anyone do that for me? I'm just curious. Yeah, I'm sure you can look it up. Like, what's the average number of kids we have in maybe, say, Canada? Um, and it's actually interesting because I was going to say, if you include U.S. as well, I think the number actually would be a little bit higher because I do think that they have more kids per, uh, they, they have more kids on average, right? Um, so it's, and, and it's very interesting because that changes per country, obviously. Some countries have a lot more kids. Um, where I'm from in El Salvador, it's very common to have a big family, right? Um, but in, in Canada, I think it's like two or three. I think that's the average, right? And if you even look, probably just do a quick scan among your friends, you probably will notice that that's the most common number, right? Two or three, especially nowadays. But I'm sure if you guys have talked to your grandparents and stuff, they probably can tell you, right? They had like lots of kids back then, yeah. Um, can you show that one with the formula we learned about? Oh, of course, yeah. So how do we show it with the formula? I'm actually glad you mentioned that. So, give me to the chase. I was actually thinking that right now. So, if we want to do the formula, we write mean. Or, I'm actually going to use the formal way to write, to write it. X with a line over top. And all we're really going to do is we're going to say we're counting all the values from 1 all the way up to 10. And again, we go all the way up to 10 because there's 10 pieces of data. And we're essentially saying we're adding all the pieces of data 1 to 10. This is really what that's saying is take x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5 all the way up to x10. And what I mean by like x10 or x1 is just saying like the So x1 just refers to the first one right here. x2 is the second one there. And you kind of see the pattern, right? x3, x4, that's what I'm saying. I'm adding all the pieces of data, 1 to 10, and then I'm di simply dividing by how many pieces pieces of data I have. So I already know, Sophie told me in the first part, that if I take x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, all the way up to x10, I end up getting 35. And I know I have 10 pieces of data, and so that's our n, and that gives us 3.5. I'm actually glad you asked that because um, in university you use that notation a lot more. And obviously something like mean is so simple that you're probably like, why do we use a formula? But it is good for you to know because sometimes it does get more complicated, right? When you get into correlation coefficient, the formula looks very scary. But if you actually break it down, it's actually that's really what it's asking you. Hopefully that makes sense.
Is that good? Okay. Uh, so next part, median. So I'm sure you guys know this one. Median is basically the middle value of your list of values that you have. Really key word here though, you might want to underline this. When you list them in order of size. People always forget this. So you can't actually find the middle one until you put them in order. If you don't put it in order, then you may not get the right answer, right? Because data might be given to you in like a random order, like the one up here. It was not in order given, it wasn't originally given to us in order, so the first step is to put it in order. So there's kind of an exception. It's pretty, this one's a lot, I would say is easier. You basically line them up and find the middle number. If you have like, for example, five pieces of data. So let's say I have like the letters, you know, people, Alice, Bob, Charlie, Diana, and Edward, right? This is an example. Uh, if I say like, you know, if they're going in order from smallest to biggest and I say, okay, which one's the median? I think most people can see here is the one in the middle is C, right? But it does actually get more complicated than you think because as soon as you start adding more values, it's actually not that clear where the middle one would be. It's not always that simple. Um, so in the, actually, let's just do a little activity here. You can even try it in the whiteboard there. If you go from A to Z, what's the, what would be the, the median letter? Which letter is in the middle? You probably don't think about letters. I'm sure you're not thinking of letters in terms of numbers, like in the number order that they go in. And so this is where it gets a little tricky. I gave you kind of a weird one. So we have 26 letters in the English alphabet, right? So which letter or letters would be in the middle? Anyone want to guess? You can just write on, on the board there and I can look. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think most of you got it, yeah. So most of you got it, but then you missed one maybe tiny thing. So most of you said the letter M, right? And why is it the letter M? Because M would be the, the 13th letter, right? So you're on the right track there. So it's the 13th one. But then if we're looking at 26 different letters, if there's so if you have an even number of them, that actually means you have two in the middle, right? Sorry? Like M. Yeah, M and N, exactly, right? So as an example, just to give you an easy one here, if I add an F there, all of a sudden, this C that used to be in the middle, it's technically, it is still in the middle, but now, technically, there's another one in the middle as well. So it kind of shifts the, the meaning a little bit. So if you have the rule here is that if you have an even number of pieces of data, then that means you actually end up with two values in the middle. So the rule here, you might want to underline this, you remember, then you're going to have to find the mean of the two middle values. So if you have an even number of them, then you're going to have to find the mean of the two middle values. So this example with the alphabet, it's great, but unfortunately I was just thinking it's also not great either because you can't really find the, the mean of two letters. Um, but again, if you go from, if you switch the letters, if you assign them a number, so A being 1, B being 2, and so on, then it would be 13.5, right? So between the 13th letter and the 14th letter is 13.5. I was going to do an activity with your heights, but unfortunately, because of social distancing and the whole thing, I was like, maybe not. But um, if we had more time, I, I'd like, what I like to do is always put people, if you guys don't mind, I put people from like tallest to uh, shortest, and then just like to look at the height. It's always interesting to look at that, right? That's really what meeting is. You're just trying to find the middle person there. So there is a weird formula, and I'll kind of explain to you what this is. Again, formulas seem really intimidating. They're actually not that hard. So the rule here, if you had an odd number of values, then if you want to find the middle value, there's a nice, easy trick here. You add one to the number of values you have and divide by two, and that's going to be your middle value. And you can even try this out with something simple, and I'll give you an example here. So let me erase this. So let's say I give you the values 1, 2, 3, and this is really simple. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 
7, 8, and 9. So I have 9 pieces of data, and let's just say that they literally go 1 all the way up to 9. It's not very fun. Sorry, guys. It's not a fun example here, but I just want to show you what I mean by this. So the middle value, obviously, you can always find it by... Did anyone do this in elementary school, by the way? Like, they, is that what you learned? So I always I learned this in elementary school, and I still use it all the time. Cross out the, the lowest one and the highest one, and keep going until you get to the middle. So you can always do that if you have a small piece of data. Yes, I got it. Sorry, I went in a different order there. So that at five ends up being your middle number. So you could always do this, and you can list it off, and then you see visually that five is going to be your middle value. Let's actually use the formula to figure this out. So the formula basically says, take the number of values you have, which is 9, add 1, and divide by 2. So let's just do the math just to check that we get the same answer. So 9 plus 1 divided by 2, we end up getting 5. So that means that, so the, just keep in mind, that doesn't mean that 5 is your median. No, it, it is in this case, but not all the time. What that means is your median is the fifth one. That's basically what we're saying. So whatever the fifth value is, that's your mean. So just to be clear, because sometimes when people look at that formula, they assume that that gives them the final answer. doesn't give you the final answer. What that does is it helps you find out where your final answer is in that list. Does that make sense? Because then you look at it and say, okay, well, I know my the, the fifth value on my list from smallest to biggest is going to be my median. Everyone okay with that? And then for, can I erase this? Just want to make sure, okay. And then for the median, if there's an even number, so that when there's an even number, we already talked about this, it gets a little more complicated because then we have two values that are in the middle. So then what you have to do is take the mean of the n divided by two term. So whatever term you have right in the middle, that, this one actually makes a lot of sense, right? If you're finding the middle of something, divide it by two. So you take the number of values, divide by two, and then all you do is look at the next term that comes after. So you might want to, I think it might be helpful if you write this. What I mean by n plus one divided by two, sorry, n divided by two plus one is the term that comes right after. That's really what I'm saying. So all I'm doing is I'm simply taking the mean of the value that I have when I divide n by 2, right? Um, so I look at n divided by 2 term. I say 2 because I'm looking, I'm using n divided by 2 to help me find out where it is in the list. And then I look at the term right after it, and then I take the mean of the 2. So again, a lot of things in math, they don't really make a lot of sense unless we look at it. So let's look at an example. So here we have, uh, so I'm asking you guys to line up students based on height. Unfortunately, we did not get to do this, this example in live. Uh, so I'm going to make this a little bit easy. I'm just going to do numbers, if you don't mind. Let's just pretend we're lining up numbers. And it's a very easy example, but it's just hopefully illustrates kind of what I mean by this. So three, four, five, six, and seven. So if you're trying to find the mean, uh, sorry, the median here, obviously you can use that method that we learned in elementary school of uh, taking out the, the biggest one, the smallest one, biggest, next biggest one, next smallest one, until you get to the middle value. Or we can use the formula. Let's just use the formula so we get comfortable with it. Sorry, I didn't know. Yeah, Sylvie? Okay. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, it's, it's Seven plus one divided by two. Two. Yeah. Perfect. So then we're really looking at the fourth term, right? That's really what we're saying here, is that we're looking at the fourth term, and that's going to be our middle one. And what's our fourth term? Well, our fourth term is four. Just so you know, this example is so easy because I literally did numbers one to seven. It, it happens to be that, you know, the fourth term is also four. It's not always, you guys know, hopefully, it's not always that way, right? It's just that it, I happen to pick easy numbers. That's all it is. And the next one here, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So let's just practice with this formula. So the formula tells me 
that my middle value is simply going to be which term or which terms? Yeah, Grace? Four and five. Yeah, four and five, exactly. And we got four because we take eight divided by two, which is four. So I'm going to write fourth term. And then the other one is going to be eight divided by two plus one, which is the fifth term. So all we need to do in this case is go to our fourth term and our fifth term. And then the rule here is that you just take the average of the two of them, or the mean of the two of them. So that means my median would be what in this case? Yeah, Sophie? 4.5? You got it. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. I just, so, eight plus one uh okay so if you do eight plus one divided by two then you end up getting 4.5 so just so you know that you get the exact same answer in this case because those numbers are literally one to eight so the first one is one the second one is two it doesn't always work that way but yes i i do know what you mean you can still use that idea right like because some people I know people always bring this up because they say, like, why can't we just divide by 2 all the time or do n plus 1 divided by 2? You could, but just keep in mind that you end up getting a decimal. You just have to remind yourself that you have to look at the value that comes before it and after. The rule of thumb here is, and this is just a formula to help you, you don't, because a lot of times when I give this formula, people are like, that's actually more confusing, and they already know how to do it. And I'm like, you know what? If you have a method that works all to you, like, you don't have to use this formula. It's just like, the, and the formula really, I only suggest it when the examples get hard. Th these examples are so easy that you don't really need it. Uh, but you will see some examples where you have like 1,257 pieces of data, right? That's not going to be that easy to figure out right away what the mean is, right? And you also don't want to be canceling out numbers. It's going to take you way too long. Does everyone understand this so far? Okay, the last one, mode. I didn't really write anything for it because it was one line. So mode is actually quite easy. Basically, it's the one that's the most frequently, uh, sorry, the one with the highest frequency. In other words, the one that comes up the most, right? Uh, and the word frequency, I know we use that a lot. Some of you maybe were a little confused. So just to be clear, frequency just means the number of times something occurs. So mode is quite easy. It's the one with the highest frequency. Um, an example when you use mode, because uh, mode is ten tends to not be as commonly used, uh, we might use that for when we do marks, right? Oh, sorry, what were we gonna say? Okay. Sorry. I was gonna. Say oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I heard something. Uh, so mode uh, mode is is very common to use as a like even with teaching now we try to look at. So I'll be honest, as a teacher, I look at your mean mark, so I look at your average, uh, but then I also try to consider the other option as well. Sometimes when the marks are kind of sporadic. I do look at the mode as well, right? I look at like what's the most common mark that we've seen. So yeah, maybe they had one fluke, right? But for the most part, it's been pretty consistent. Then we look at the mode, right? Um, but I'll be honest, mode isn't as commonly used. The only time that you would really want to know the mode is if you're looking at qualitative data. So sometimes you want to like, you know, figure out what's people's favorite movie, right? So there's no way, can we find the, the mean number, sorry, the mean, favorite movie no we're not allowed, we can't really do that right so sometimes data it just makes more sense if you're looking at the mode so if i'm trying to figure out all right what movie do you guys want to watch on friday or something right and then i sh I, I do a raise of hands that's mode right i'm not going to find that mean number of movie that you want to watch that doesn't make any sense right so in a lot of times when we're talking about qualitative data the mode makes the most sense right you're just consider you're really just concerned about what do most people want that's really what it is. Okay, so uh, small thing about mode, I forgot to mention this. It's possible to have more than one mode. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, people always ask that, is it possible to have more than one? Absolutely, right? Um, so mean and median, you can't. Obviously, it's only one mean and median, but mode, you can have more than one. Okay, so what's the difference between them? Because once you go over this, this is where people get a little bit confused. So... For the most part, uh, mean and median are the ones that people are going to confuse a lot. Mode is kind of the odd man out. It doesn't really connect as much with them. 
uh, but they all describe, they basically are three different descriptions of the center of data, right? And in terms of when we use which one, it really honestly just depends on the type of data you have. So the rule here, uh, if there are outliers, and I'll explain what that is. So if there's outliers in your data, it's probably going to be a lot better that you use mean and median. Sorry, it's going to be better that you use uh, median, and, and we'll talk about the reason for this, is because median actually is less affected by your outliers. So what is an outlier? So I'll just explain what that is first. Uh, I think we kind of briefly have mentioned this before, and you probably have heard about this maybe in grade 9. I know they cover it a little bit. Does anyone remember learning about outliers? Maybe, I don't know. And grade 9 was a while back. And that's a hard thing, right? I feel like you've learned some of this stuff in grade 9. You haven't seen it in four, three or four years, right? So an outlier basically is a value that looks is noticeably different than the rest of the values you have, right? Uh, so a real-life example, you're looking at heights, right? And let's say we're looking at teenagers. If we bring a little toddler in here, right, the little toddler is obviously going to be smaller. Their height is going to be an outlier, right? Or if we bring in an NBA player who's extremely tall, they are also going to be an outlier, right? Because their height is a lot bigger, noticeably bigger than everyone else, right? Um, so there's no set rule. The hard thing with outlier, people always ask, like, is there a set rule to know if something is an outlier or not? There's not really a set rule. Um, you just kind of notice it in your data. Normally, you will notice it when you put it on a graph. So if you put this on a graph, and let's say we're doing a bar graph for a histogram, and then we notice that there's a value that is really, really away from everything else, that's an outlier, right? It's not your normal mark or your normal piece of data. In this one here, we can clearly see that these two are outliers because everything is kind of following in a nice little line. So we talked about correlation yesterday, remember? So correlation, we normally notice that there's either a weak or a moderate correlation, right? But then there's going to be one piece of value that's kind of all over the place. It doesn't really follow the rest of the data. That's an outlier. Anyone think of other examples of outliers? Or like, give me an example where you might have an outlier. Any example, guys? Yeah, man. Oh, sorry. Like test scores. Yep, as perfect example. Test scores, actually. So I showed you a couple test scores. I always like doing that. And again, that's this is I'm telling you all the secret, all my secrets. Right? That's what I do as a teacher at the end, especially on D two L because everything's marked online. I love looking at the results. That little graph. I think I showed you that graph, right? And I kind of see like a bit of a pattern. Most people are in the 70s, a lot of people, a few people in the 80s, very few in the 90s, and it kind of goes a little bit like this. And then sometimes I'll have like a random mark here at the 100, or sometimes I'll have a random mark here below 50, and those are kind of like my outliers. It's kind of like my extremes, right? Um, and those are always good for me to know as well, because then I can say, okay, I, I always want to know what's, what's happening in general, but I'm also curious to know what's happening in the other extremes, right? Or the points where no one seems to be hitting, right? So either the lower end or the upper end, right? Like it's always interesting to look at that. So if you have an outlier, your outlier is gonna be changing your mean a lot more than your median. Why is that? So why does, it, why does the outlier affect the mean? Uh, sorry, why does it affect the mean a lot more than the median? Yeah. Because it's incorporated into the sum mm -hmm. of the values in mean and mean. Exactly, right? So when we look at median, we're only interested in the points in the middle. So if I have, let's say I only have one outlier as an example, right? If I have a couple outliers, it might change. But if I only have like one or two outliers, it doesn't really change from the fact that most values are still going to be in the middle. So if I decide to like add in one extra value, so kind of going back to this example, one, two, three, four, five, and then I add on six. It doesn't change my median that much, right? It, my median went from being three to being between three and four, which is 3.5. It's not that extreme. But if I for, and actually, you know what? That's a bad example because six is barely noticeable. 100. There we go. That's a better example. So if I add in the 100 or any number here, any number that's larger than 5, it doesn't actually change my value that much. My median is still 3.5, which is not that different from 3, right? But with my mean, exactly like Grace was saying, 
it does make a big difference because I'm adding all these up. So that 100 that I add on there actually makes a huge difference, right? Much bigger than the median. So as a general rule, if we notice that there's outliers, we normally want to pick the median instead of the mean. And the reason for that is because any sort of bigger, really large value or really small value will change everything around, right? And that's why in the end, so you guys were talking about report cards we did that as an example. That's why with report cards, we use uh, median, not mean, right? Because in most classes, there are outliers, right? You have people who are failing or you have sometimes people that get like 100%, right? And then maybe the most people are not even getting 100%. Most people are only getting 70s, 80s. So that 100% that you add on there or that 30% that you add on there makes a big difference, right? Either extreme. It'll either drop down the average or it will bring it up a lot more. So normally we tend to prefer median because it doesn't actually make a big difference, right? If you add on or subtract off of a small value, it doesn't change that much. Just curious, actually, I think Matt, you were doing the calculation there. What was the mean for this one? Uh, yeah, thank you. So this is actually a perfect example just to see how extreme that is, right? 19.1 was actually uh, the median for this. And what was the mean for just these values here? One, two, three, four, five, three, right? So you can see a big difference. The mean went from three to 19.1, that's pretty extreme. Whereas the median, it went from three to 3.5. So the, the median is quite strong in, in that sense, right? In the sense that it doesn't really change that much if you add in outliers. So the rule there, if you have outliers, probably best to use median, right? Uh, but there's no really rule, uh, honestly, as much as I say that this is kind of a rule, it's not written in stone. Um, if you're asked to find average, and again, different companies do different things. The most common one I would say is mean, because that's the one that most of us are familiar with. Uh, but every now and then, especially in schools, we do tend to use mean support. Okay, so let's look at this next example here, guys. So we have pieces of data here, and we're looking at ages in this case. So we are counting out the ages of all the people in, in a room at CCH. And the ages are 14, 15, 15, 16, 16, 15, 16, 14, 15, 15, 15, 16, 14, 45. So I actually helped you a little bit. And actually, it sounds like I did this on purpose. We're finding the median. I myself is getting confused about the order. So I put it in order myself first. Um, but feel free to do it yourself on, on your handout. So find the, uh, the mode, the median, and then we'll do the mean. And then the last little part, we'll talk about the comparison between the mean and the median. Anyone want to share the first answer there? What's the mode? Yeah. 15. 15, right? And again, does this make sense that we're talking about ages at CCH? Right? So I just picked a room. And like I said, I just let's just say I walk into a room randomly and I just ask them, hey, how old is everyone here in this room? And I just record all the ages. So it makes sense that we're in a high school. Uh, Anything in the in the uh, in the teens, right? So like all the way from fourteen to eighteen is probably going to be your normal values, right? Uh, what about the median? Yeah. Seventeen for the oh, uh, you know what? I think that was the mean. Oh yeah. Yeah, for the mean, it was you know I'll just write it here though. So for the mean, did you can you tell me what the sum of all the values were? Um, two hundred. Two hundred and forty-one. And then there are 14 pieces of data. So that means that my mean 
is going to be 241 divided by 14, which is 17.2. Everyone got that? And that was like rounded, right? Yeah, because I think it's like, yeah. So that's okay. Yeah, and we can round it. That's fine. So with mean, sometimes you will have to round. That's fine. So I just use that symbol for approximation, right? Just approximately what it is. So 17.2 is the average, sorry, is the mean. And then uh, and I always tend to do that. When I talk about average, we normally talk about mean. Um, median. So what's the median here? Yeah. Yeah. 15, perfect. And we can do, we can use the formula if you want here, or you can kind of cross them off. I'm just going to use the formula just to kind of practice. So n divided by 2, so we're looking for the seventh term. And then the rule here is you look for the next term as well. So let's, we're looking for the seventh and the eighth term. So what is the seventh and eighth term here? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is the seventh one. And this is the eighth one. So we actually are finding the median between the 15 and the 15. That's actually pretty easy. What's the median between 15 and 15? 15, right? So it's pretty easy there. So it's just going to be 15. So notice that I got the same me as the same mode, same median, and actually there are a lot of cases where you end up getting the same one for all three. Um, but this one is not one of the cases, right? We have 15 for the mode, 15 for the median, and then notice that the mean is still kind of close to it, but it's still definitely different, right? 17.2, which is actually kind of weird because most people are not actually no one is 17, right? Which is really odd. So that's the other weird thing is that median you actually has more resemblance with the data, whereas sometimes mean will not even have you. You're going to look at your mean and you're going to be like, where did that come from, right? Seventeen point two is not even in this piece of data. That's okay, right? Um, so there's a reason that there's a reason that the mean is so much higher than it it should be. It's, it's so much higher than most of the pieces of data in this in this uh, setting here. So why is that the case? Why is seventeen point two quite different than the rest. So why why is the mean and the median really different here? Yeah. Um, the mean, you have to include the 45, which I consider an outlier. Exactly, right? So I'm going to write here, mean includes 45, which is an outlier, exactly. Perfect. So because 45 is an outlier, that really throws off all your data, right? So who is that Who's that 45-year-old person? Probably a teacher, right? Or a staff. So that 45-year-old person actually threw that mean completely off the walls, right? Because it actually should have been a lot lower. It should have been closer to 15. And because we add that 45-year-old, it shifts it all around. So... Um, because of that change, then obviously the mean and the median are going to be quite different in this case. Um, so now for the next step, it says remove the outlier from the data and now calculate the mean. So what do you get if you if you do not include the 45-year-old person? And if you don't mind, I actually might use the formula here. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Um, so then... The 13 summation symbol i equals 1 xi over 13 because we were 45, so that changes. Yep. One second. I'm just going to rewrite it because I want to write it a little bit nicer. Uh, and I do not have enough space for all the summation, but I'm just going to write sigma. At least we know what that is. xi, so we're adding all the values. Yep. And so then. The sum of the values is 196. 196 divided by 13. Which equals 15.0769 other values. Exactly. So I'll say 15.07. Perfect. And that seems a little closer to what we should have had, right? Um, and then that makes a lot more sense with all the values that we have. And it's closer to our answer that we got for median and median, right? So, again... Having that outlier sometimes, and I think Mr. Edwards was just talking about this thing, or I can't remember actually if it was who mentioned this or not, 
but basically we talked about how you, and you're all, and when you collect all your pieces of data and you're trying to find correlation or you're trying to find the relationship between two variables if you have a really big outlier it's sometimes helpful and it's and not to say that you're going to exclude it but it's helpful to do a calculation with the outlier and then do a calculation without the outlier so you can kind of compare and tell the, the reader whoever's reading your project and say you know what i calculated two different ways i included the outlier and then i didn't include the outlier just so you see the difference that that one outlier made right because sometimes including an outlier will actually change your data completely so you might have a very valid argument but then that one exception to the rule is going to throw your argument off right um and you see this in real life right like when people are trying to make a point they're like you know if you do like you know when people say you know if you if you study hard you're going to get good marks and then you always think of exceptions right so the exceptions being someone that doesn't study at all like they're like i have a friend who doesn't study at all and they get 100 percent and everything or you have the opposite you could be like you know i have a friend who studies all night and uh you know gets a 50 all the time right so there's always those big exceptions but if you're making an argument generally speaking you you tend to focus on the average. You tend to focus on what most people are, are, are going towards, right? And most people, we would agree, if you study hard, you're gonna get a good mark, right? But you always have exceptions, right? And so you wanna consider it, but you don't want it to take over your data completely. Does that make sense? All right, so the conclusion here, just gonna erase this. What's the conclusion? So the mean is more effective by an outlier whereas the median is not. And it's affected in some way, but it's not never that, um, never extreme, right? So it's always worth considering the deviation. So this is the new word here. So it's called deviation. And actually, I'm gonna leave this more to Mr. Edward to do uh, in the next lesson. Uh, he'll talk more about deviation, yeah? Uh, but basically deviation, just so you know for now, just introducing that word. It's the difference between your value and the mean. So going back to this example up here, if this is our mean, the deviation is simply 14 minus 17.2, 14 minus 17.2, 16 minus 17.2, 45 minus 17.2. It's just the difference between the value and the mean. That's all it is. Everyone okay with this so far? All right. Next part, weighted mean. Uh, how many of you have seen this before? Weighted mean, or it kind of rings a bell. I think some of you have heard of it. Um, this actually is really important because this is how your marks are determined, right? Uh, so if you have ever been, you know, writing, about to go write an exam or write, you know, finish the culminating and you're wondering, what mark do I have right now? You, I'm sure you guys always have that question, right? Like, what mark do I need to get this, to get this final mark? This is a really, t this is where it gets really useful, right? Uh, we look at weighted average because, again, not all values are always going to be the same. So. What we're doing in weighted val and weighted mean, we're still calculating mean, but there's a little twist to it. Sometimes values are actually worth more than other pieces of data, right? So in all the other examples, every single person that was there counted their height counted only once, right? It's not like one person's height was worth or one person's age was worth more than someone else's age, right? Everyone's age was worth the same. But you guys know in real life, especially when we look at marks, it's not always going to be that case, right? Some marks are actually going to be worth more than others. So what you do in this case, there's one little twist to it. Instead of just adding all the values, you are going to be multiplying the actual value, which is xi. So I'm just going to be clear in here. xi is your value. And do you see that little word, the w there? wi. It represents your weight. That's the weight of the value. So another way of saying that is how much your value is worth. I could be totally wrong on this, but I think, do you guys do this in science, weighted average, with when you're like measuring or chemicals? I don't know. It's, it's been forever since I think of science. So, okay. I'm making it up, then. I don't know. I was thinking, maybe, I don't know if I'm thinking of another subject, I have no idea. But I, for some reason, I thought maybe you guys did weight, weighted average. Um, okay, so basically the rule of thumb here, take the weight, you multiply it by the value, and then you're adding them all up, so it's not really that different, you still add up all the values. And then the only difference is that, so the other, the other difference when you're done, 
is instead of dividing by the number of values that you have, you divide by the total amount of the weight. So this is what this value is saying at the bottom here. It's the total weights. So when you take all the weights together and you add them up, that's where you're going to be dividing by. So that's what I mean by all these little symbols. Because I feel like in math, you use all these symbols and they look scary, right? They look terrifying, but really all we're doing is breaking it down. We're saying, take the, each value you have multiplied by its weight, then you add them all up, just like me. It's not that different, right? And then the very last thing is instead of dividing by n, you're dividing by the total of the weights. That's all we're doing here. Everyone good with this so far? Okay, so let's look at an example here. So Michael Scott is taking his first is taking first year stats. Anyone know the reference? Office, right? Uh, so his final mark is made up of two midterm exams, uh, and they're each worth twenty five percent. An assignment is worth ten percent, and a final exam is worth forty percent. So the first question there: determine his final mark if he gets fifty five percent in the first midterm. 80% in the second midterm, 75% in the first assignment, and 70% in the final exam. So this is a really good question for all of you to know, actually. So then, so then when you get to college, university, you know exactly how your final mark is helping, right? So you, you don't really need to ask a prof or anyone, like, what's my mark right now? You actually can always determine your mark, right, at, at any point. So let's do this one together, just because I feel like it's it's not it's not too hard of a concept, but I think the formula itself makes it a little bit tricky. So <clears throat> where it says uh, determine the final mark, so what we're going to do is we're simply going to take all the values that we have here, the actual marks, and we're going to include the weights along with it, right? So I hope I have enough space for this. I feel like um, this marker, the writing is a lot thicker than it should be. So this one. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of the marks that I have and just multiply by their weight. So my first mark is 55%. So I'm going to actually just going to write that as 55. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply that by the weight for that by the weight of that first assessment. So how much was that first midterm worth? Yeah. 25%, so I'm going to multiply by, Zero. thank you. So this word, people get a little bit confused, right? Sometimes by accident, you, write, you multiply by 25, but it's 0 0.25, right? Because we're talking about percent. Next one, um, I'm going to take my mark for my second exam, which is 80%, and I'm going to multiply by 0 0.25. It's actually the exact same math, right? This is 25%. What about my next one? Someone else want to guide me? Yeah, Jessica? 75 times 10%. 75 times 10%, which is 0 0.10 or 0 0.1. Perfect. And the last one? I want to take it. Yeah, Sophie? Uh, 70 times 0 0.40, perfect. I'm just going to write 0 0.4, but it's the exact same. Perfect. And then all I'm doing at the very end is I'm going to divide by the total amount of the weights. So I'm going to add up all the different weights. So in this case, I'm going to add up 0 0.25 plus 0 0.25 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.4. And without even doing a lot of math, I'm hoping everyone can see that the denominator there will have to be one because you're adding up all your marks. So if you were to hypothetically add up all the weights, you should just get one, right? It should amount to 100%. So if any of you are wondering, how do you do this calculation? If you if didn't, let's say that you didn't have the final exam yet, like you haven't written the final exam and you want to know What's my mark just from the two assignments altogether or up to this S or just up to the third assignment that you have there? What you would do is you would add all of them up, but not exclude not include the last one there. 
and then instead of dividing by 1, what would you divide by? Let's say the final exam isn't calculated yet. Yeah, Grace? 0 0.6, right? So you divide by 0 0.6 because the 0 0.4 wouldn't be added on there. So it's very easy to manipulate this formula. So you don't, it doesn't only work for the final mark. It works for any point at the course, right? This is really helpful for you guys. So just so you know my little tricks, uh, tricks of the trade here, when I calculate your mark, and actually if you know this, then you can be able to, you can calculate your mark fully right now. Um, what I do is I take, I basically multiply your test mark, whatever your test mark is, by three, and I do this on Excel. And then I take whatever your quiz marks are, and I multiply by one. We don't have any assignments because unfortunately the course is so crammed in, but if I had assignments, I would also take your assignment marks, and I multiply by two. That's just generally my rule. I feel like every teacher has their own system. That's generally how I weigh, as I say, you know, a test is obviously more, there's more questions, more depth in it, you have to explain more. I'll make it worth three quizzes. It's really short answers, so that's only going to be worth one. And any assignments are just worth two. And then what I do is I take all your different marks, I multiply by those amounts, and then when I'm done at the very end, I divide by how many weights I have altogether. So if I had, like, for example, three tests and one quiz, that would be the weights, the total of the weights would be three plus three plus three plus one, right? Again, I think I'm going a little overhead if you're, if you're kind of looking at that and you're like, oh, geez, that's a lot of information. Don't worry about it. I'm just telling you my tricks, right? Um, you don't have to know that. That's just the way I do it. But in university, college, it's actually quite easy. This is exactly how they break down the marks. And in college, university, it tends to literally be, you know, two big exams and a couple of assignments and that's it, right? Very short. So let's do the math here. What is the final mark for this person? Yeah, Sophie? 61.25%. Does that seem like a reasonable mark based on everything they got? Yeah? Oh, 69.25. Perfect. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm like, 61 seemed a little low. 69.25 seems a little, little more accurate, right? And sometimes you just get a little bit of a ballpark, right? So you look at this and say, okay, well, he like kind of did not do well on that one, 55%, but he did well on the other one. So it's almost like they bounced out. So I just roughly, in my head, I think 55 and 80, what's between them, like somewhere in like the close to 70, right? We're getting close to 70. And then we add on the 75%, which is really good, but remember, that's only worth 10%, so we can't put the same weight on it. And, on, and then the final exam, he got 70% on it, but again, because the, the because the first midterm he did really bad on it, it really did drop down the work, right? Um, because it did have it was still worth twenty five percent. It actually had a quite a big weight. If the seventy percent, sorry, if the fifty five percent had gone to the final assignment, you probably would have been in the clear. You probably could have gone to seventy, right? So it's one of those little uh, little details, right? It's, it's not just a matter of what marks you got, but where. Did he get those marks, right? Did he get those bad marks on the small assignments or did he get the bad marks on the big assignments, right? That makes a difference. Okay, and then in the last part here, it says Michael Scott, uh, Scott decides to argue with his professor, Dr. Flanderson, that all his assessments should actually be worth the same. So if they are all worth the same, how, what would his mark be? I just want to see a little bit of a comparison. So let's say the professor decides, you know what? All, all your assessments were equally hard, so all of them should be worth the same. So how does that change his final mark? They're all worth the same. Yeah. Exactly. So do you see all this calculation we did up here? You could basically do it, well, there's two ways to do it. One way is the, like a bit of like with the formula, right? You take every single mark, 55 times 0 0.25, because they're each worth 25%. I'm just going to show you how, how this works. And then there's a lot, uh, there's a much easier way after this. Uh, divided by one. What's the easier way of doing this? Instead of taking all the different percentage, they're all worth the same? Yeah. Just add them all together. Exactly. So actually, if they're, if they're all exactly the same, then you can just use the same method we used up there. You can just add them all up and divide by four. So this is totally fine. You can still do this, no problem with that. 
But the I would say the easier way to do this. I don't know if I have space there. The easier way to do this, and I'll just kind of maybe do it up here. Take the sum of the values, or sum of all the marks, and divide by four. That's the easier way to do it. And again, the reason you're allowed to do that is because they're all worth the same. So if they're all worth the same, then you can just add them all up, and divide by how many you have. Does that make sense? Perfect. I always say this is the really useful kind of math because you have no idea how many times you will use this, like more than you think. How many of you have done that before an exam? I think everyone has done that, right? You're like, what do I need to pass? Or what do I need to get an 80? What do I need to get a 90? You're like, you're just doing math. Like you spend more math doing that than the actual math, right? Uh, <laughs> that's, this is actually useful, right? I'm sure, and this will be very practical for you. And I know that this is something not just in math, I'm sure in all your classes you probably want to know, like, yeah, what's my work? Or, how am I doing in this course, right? Um, and unfortunately, obviously, if you have a, if your teacher sometimes might be able to just tell you what the mark is, but sometimes they'll just say, you know what, calculate on your own, right? Um, so this is really helpful. All right, so the next part, frequency tables. Let's just turn the page here, guys. Uh, so frequency tables, uh, what we use them for, for, first of all, what is a frequency table? Basically, it lists off your, uh, it lists off all the data by describe by assigning a frequency to it. So we're basically counting out how often each piece of data occurs, right? Uh, so when is this really helpful? Well, frequency tables are really helpful when you have a lot of repeated data, right? So remember in the first day, I think, the, uh, yeah, I think the first day that we did probability, we did the dice roll, and then I asked you guys to record how many times you get each sum. This is when a frequency table is really handy, right? Because if you didn't have a frequency table, you would literally have to list off all the different outcomes. So you'd have to write one, two, uh, six, five, three, four, four, two, three. Like it would take you a long time. And personally, this is just an opinion. It looks very messy, right? It's not very nice and organized. So what a frequency table does is it takes something that's very, very messy, puts it in a nice little table for you. So you don't have to decipher through it, you don't have to reorganize it, it all just puts it nicely in categories. Like, frequency tables are really nice. It's a nice way to kind of express your data. So when I talk about uh, in your culminating task, I ask that you put it in a chart or a table that's easy to read. This is what I mean, right? I want it to be nicely, uh, it has to be really readable to the person, right? So we shouldn't be like looking at all your data. I really hope you don't give me a hundred pieces of data and you're just like, Boom! Yeah, read all those, read all those numbers. That I mean, I can, but that seems very confusing, and it's not really going to give me a lot of information. You don't really see patterns unless you start putting it in a more organized way, right? So what we do in a frequency table, we actually can still calculate the mean, but because it's actually written in a table instead of actually written in a list, it actually makes it a bit easier, in my opinion, to calculate the mean. So to calculate the mean, all we're really doing is you're multiplying each of the values by their frequency. So you take the number of values that you have and you multiply by how many times it occurs. And why are we multiplying? Why are we doing that for the frequency? I'm not trying to trick you or anything. Like for example, we, we actually are gonna do this example so you'll see what I mean. So if we say like, you know, Three, uh, five people got a mark of three. I could take three plus three plus three plus three plus three, or I could just do three times five, right? So the reason we multiply is it's just a shortener. So instead of taking a calculator and adding, you know, a bunch of times, in this case, it would be a total of 20 times. If you already have it nicely set up in a table, you might as well just multiply to simplify the work, right? So we already know how many, the values and how many times it occurs. Just take the value and multiply by the frequency. So this, again, is a very scary looking formula, but the formulas, it makes it look more complicated than it is. That's really all it's telling you, is take the frequency of each value, multiply by the value. And then when you're done, it's the exact same thing as before, you divide by how many values you have. Does that make sense? I just wanna explain one small thing in the textbook. They mentioned this formula, but instead of dividing by n, they actually divide by the total frequencies. 
And just so everyone is clear, so you know that I'm not lying to you, the textbook's not lying to you, this is the exact same thing. If you add up all the frequencies, that makes sense, right? If you add up all the number of times different values occur, it should give you n, which is the total number of times you've done it. So let's look at this example here. So I give you a quiz, I give this class a quiz, 20 students, and the quiz is out of five. So this table shows you what all the marks are. So determine the mean, median, and mode. So I'll let you try this one out. Just turning it on there. Okay, sorry guys, I'm just going to repeat one small thing because I forgot to put it in the video there. Okay, so what we did to find the mean is we simply multiplied the values or the marks here by their frequencies. And then we multiply the marks by the frequencies. This gives us this total result here, which is 0, 2, 4, 15, 24, and 20. Then we add them up, we end up getting 65, and we divide by the total frequency, which is 20. So again, to find the median, just to be clear on this, uh, what you're doing is you're using the formula to make it a little bit faster, right? So you're simply taking 20 divided by 2, which gives you 10. So you're looking for the 10th term and the next term, which is the 11th term. And then what we do is we count the frequencies until we get to the 10th term and the 11th term. So hopefully that kind of makes sense, uh, how we find the mean and the median. And of course, the last one, mode. Which one's mode? Yeah. Four. Yeah. Actually, mode is really easy on a frequency table, right? Uh, all you do is go to the highest frequency and then look at the value next to it. This is a really common mistake, though, and I will warn you about this. People, believe it or not, a lot of people got this wrong. Um, they end up writing six because they look for the biggest frequency and they're like, oh, it's six. So that means six is the mode. Six isn't the mode. Six is simply the frequency of the mode. So that means that the actual value that you're looking for is the fourth. Everyone understand so far what we're doing? Okay, so hopefully that kind of made it clear. Um, so again, the, the value of frequency tables here, the, the importance of them is that you don't have to list numbers off, right? And I hope you kind of see the, the how much that really helps you, right? So instead of you actually listing it all off, and instead of it looking a little bit messy, you can actually put it on a nice little chart here. And it just nicely summarizes all your data. Okay, uh, last thing. Group data. Well, actually, you know what? I'll give you guys a break because it's been already pretty long. So I'll just pause it for a bit. So in uh, group data, what we're doing is um, we're actually, instead of actually looking at it discreetly, so the other examples that we did, we were mainly looking at discrete values and we were basically separating them up individually, right? So in the last one, we said, you know, let's count the number of marks that are, are, are zero. Number of marks that are one, two, three, four, five. Instead of actually marking them off individually, we actually, especially, and this you're going to use this a lot more with continuous data. You normally want to have intervals. So remember when Mr. Edwards was talking about bins? Remember how we talked about how you can take data and you can divide it into like bins or categories? That's essentially what we're doing here. Is we're going to be dividing all our data into intervals. So a perfect example of this, and I feel like the most common one for this is, mar is uh, well, marks as well, but also height, right? Because if I am collecting information about height, it is going to be really hard for me to do a frequency table where I'm like, okay, how many people have a height of 170, 171, 172, 173, 174? A lot of issues with that. You're also, one thing, you're not really going to see a pattern because you're collecting it for such small little intervals that you honestly won't even notice anything significant. And then the other issue with that is that people's heights are actually not 171 or 172. They could be like 171.285, right? It, because we're looking at continuous data, which has a range, it's actually much easier to put it in intervals, right? And it's just, and sometimes it's just more practical, right? Uh, so if you're collecting the height, uh, information about people's heights, you could obviously measure each person and I think, Grace, you were saying you did that in elementary school, right? I think some of you did something similar in elementary school where you measured the height and then you collected all that data. That was fine when it's like 20 people. But what if I wanted to know data about like, I don't know, 500 students, right? I'm not going to have time to do that. So probably the fastest way to collect all that information, especially if people don't know their heights, is simply just to put them in intervals and say, you know what? I'm not going to find each individual height. I'm just going to put you in categories. 
170 to 180, 180 to 190, 190 to 200. That seems a lot easier and faster than actually collecting each individual piece of data. Does that make sense, guys? So that's the whole idea here, is that we're actually, instead of putting, uh, putting them all individually, we're actually going to put them in intervals, right? So it's a very similar idea to a bin. And this is called a group frequency table. So it's a frequency table where we call it group because we're putting them in groups, basically. And as a general rule, we tend to use this more for continuous data, right? Because again, continuous data is really hard to kind of draw a line and say like, you know, it ends here and it starts there. It is all continuations. There's a lot of variations. So it actually makes more sense to group it in intervals instead of individual. So the rule here, is that you need to, because you're doing an interval, uh, you don't actually know which one is the value for all of them, right? And especially if we're estimating, we sometimes, instead of actually collecting the height of each person, we might say, you know what, I'll just kind of put them in categories and say like 170 to 180, 180 to 190. But the problem with that is we don't actually know what the average or what the number is for each interval. So what we do, kind of going back to using mean, we use the midpoint of the interval. So does anyone remember grade 10 midpoint? Is that where you're so familiar? Right, midpoint. Do you remember you have a line, then the midpoint was the point that is right in between that line segment? It's a similar idea here. If we have an interval, so if the interval is from 170 centimeters to 180 centimeters, I think everyone can kind of see here that the midpoint would be 170, 170, Five, right? 175, right in between, right? So that's what the midpoint is here. So another example, if I'm putting marks in between uh, in categories, and actually you actually saw that example in, on D12, uh, normally D12 automatically puts it in categories. So we normally, again, a teaching world thing, we normally put marks into categories. So I always look at it as like 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, right? And so if I'm looking at marks between, in, between the 70 and 80%, Obviously, it's great if I could get each individual mark, but sometimes I just want to know in general how the class is doing, right? I just want a quick snapshot. So I'm actually going to put them in categories. So if I put marks in categories, 70 to 80%, we don't know if the people in that category got, you know, 71%, 72%, or 79%. But we assume that everyone got 75% in that category. We just assume the middle value. It kind of makes some logical sense. You're not going to pick the lower end or the higher end. You just pick the one. Does that make sense? So the fact that we're using an estimation, we're kind of assuming, we, we assume a lot of things when we group data. We just assume that the, all the values in the interval take on the, mid, the midpoint value. That's why we, when we talk about finding mean and median, we always say we're estimating mean and median because we don't actually know the exact value. We're just kind of taking a guess or sorry, not a guess, an estimation based on what we have. So the rule here, it's actually, the, the formula is actually quite easy. It's compared, it's very easy compared to the other one that we just did. The only difference is that instead of taking the frequency and multiplying by the value, you take the frequency and multiply it by the midpoint. So I'm just going to write over here so you know what this is. You see that little MI? So you might want to write this on your page. MI represents the midpoint. So all you're doing is you're taking the midpoints instead of the values and multiplying by their frequencies, adding all of them up, and then dividing by the total frequency. Does that make sense, guys? Yes, I'll say that again. So to find the mean of group data, you take the midpoints, you find the midpoint of each interval. So it's kind of similar to the other one, except that the other one we didn't have a midpoint. Now we take the midpoint, then we multiply by its frequency. So we do that for every single interval, add them all up just like before, and then divide by the total frequency. So it's actually a really similar formula to the other one. And again, it looks different, but just keep in mind, do you see that the sum of the frequencies? Just so everyone is kind of clear on this. This is the same thing as the end which is the total number of data that you have, the total number of pieces of data. There. So that's all we're doing. So really the only difference between this and what we did in the last example with the frequency table 
is that in the in the last frequency table, we actually had it categorized in intervals that didn't have any sort of range, right? The interval was really, the, well, there was no interval. It was 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's discrete values, and they had a specific value attached to it. Now, because we're looking at continuous data, because continuous data has more range, we decided to put it in intervals, right? Uh, you could put discrete, by the way, you could put discrete data into intervals, but for the most part, we tend to use this for continuous data. That's generally what we do. So when, it's, uh, when you're looking at continuous data, it makes more sense to put in intervals because there's more variation between it, right? So going back to the example about marks, if I'm finding out what people's marks are, I could take the mark of every single person, or I might actually just put it in categories. It makes more sense, right? But the only thing is that if I put it in categories, I have to assume that everyone takes on the midpoint value, right? Because I don't know if they got like a 71, 72, or a 79. I just take the value that's written. Okay, so to estimate the median, I'll talk a little bit more about this. You have to use something called cumulative frequency. And another word for this is running frequency. Has anyone heard of this? You know what that word cumulative means? Anyone want to think? Maybe you heard it in another course or just some. Yeah. It's like all together. All together, yeah. So the word actually says it itself all together, right? So it's an all together frequency. So what it, another way of saying that is the frequency up to the point that you're at. So a running frequency just means count all the frequencies up until you need to, until the spot that you need to get to, right? And I think this will make more sense when we look at an example. I feel like cumulative frequency is hard to explain. It makes way more sense when you see it, okay? Uh, and again, going back to this question. So why did we say that all of this is estimated? Why don't we just say the mean and the median? Because I said to find the estimated mean, to find the estimated median. Why am I talking about estimation? Yeah, Chris? Um, because you're only finding the mean and the information that you have. Exactly. With the information. So someone in these examples, someone gave me all the data. I unfortunately did not collect it myself. And if they gave me the data, like in the other example, I knew exactly how many people got one. I knew exactly how many people got two, three, four, and five. In this in next example we're going to see here, it's subdivided into categories. So we don't actually know what the exact height of each person was. We just know which category they fell into. Does that make sense? So because of that, we're, we're totally almost, we're, we're basically estimating. We're hoping that most people are near the midpoint, but it could be different. So that's what we have to say estimated, right? Um, so let's look at the example here. It's, it'll make, I think it'll be pretty clear once we do the first example here. So let's say they want to find the average height of a group of students. There's 50 students. And again, this is, this is pretty realistic. It does happen that, you know, sometimes when you're recording the data, you may not actually have time to individually measure every single person there. Right? And the other issue with this is that if you're asking people their height, they're, they're not, I don't think a lot of people actually know their exact height. That's the reality, right? They kind of know generally what their height is, but they don't know their exact height. Like, what are the chances they're going to tell you exactly to the centimeter or to a decimal what their height is? Not very likely. So what you're going to do to make your life a little bit easier as a surveyor is you're actually going to ask students to select one of these categories. So the categories are 150 to 160, 160 to 170, all the way down to 200, right? Um, and then what we do is we record the frequency for each category. And now what I'm asking you in this question is to first, the first part of it, before we even start, is figure out what the midpoints of each of the intervals are. So let's just go through them together. So the, what's the midpoint of the first interval? So if someone's between 150 and 160, they could literally be 150, 151, 152.5, 157.8 or something. But what do we assume all these heights will be if anyone is in that category? What's the safe assumption? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So let's a safe bet is just to say, you know what? Everyone's 155. Right, makes sense, right? Because we we could have people that are in the lower end of it, but some that are in the higher end. So what's the average? It's 150. 
What about the next category, 160 to 170? Yes, Sophie? 165, perfect. Just you know, 175. 175. Then we have 185 and 195, right? So there are all our midpoints. And so on this table, it actually explains to you what you need to do, but remember the formula also says that as well. All you're doing is you're taking every single midpoint that you have here, and you're simply multiplying by the frequency. And again, why are we multiplying by the frequency? I hope, like, obviously you have a formula, but I hope you understand where that formula is coming from, right? We're essentially saying there are seven people that have a height between 150 and 160. So those seven people, let's make our life easy, and let's assume that all their heights are 155. So if there's seven people with the same height of 155, instead of adding 155 seven times, which is kind of tedious, in math, what do we do? We just multiply, right? Because multiplication is the same as adding over and over. So all we're going to do here is simply multiply 7 times 155. So what does that give you? 7 times 155? Yes, Sophie? 1,035, thank you. 1,085, sorry. Yes. It's this mask, I tell you. All right, and the next one? Yeah? 2,145. Perfect. Next one? Yep. 3,100. Oops. 50. Sorry, guys. It's being kind of... Can I rewrite that? Three thousand one hundred and fifty. You said right. Okay. And the next one, ten times one eighty-five. Yeah, Grace. One thousand eight. And the last one is yes, something. Three hundred and ninety. Right. Perfect. Okay. So all we're gonna do here. It's supposed to be a nine. Uh, is simply add up all these values. And this is going to help us to figure out what the mean is. So when you add them all up, what do we get? Did everyone get 8,620? Did everyone get that? Okay, I just double checking because I could make a mistake. Okay, so I got 8,620 when I add them all up. Uh, perfect, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide this by the total frequency. So what was the total frequency here? So we can add up all the frequencies or, yeah. 50. Yeah, so you can add up all the frequencies or you can look at the data that's given to you. They actually tell you it's 50. Uh, but you know what, it's always a good idea in my opinion. Uh, and also because I make mistakes on tests. Add up the frequencies yourself just to double check that it actually matches up. So we know that if we add up all the frequencies, it should be 50. And then, of course, that means that uh, so this is the next step here to find the mean. I'm actually going to write over here some space. To find the mean, all we do is take uh, 8,620 and we divide by 50. And 8,620 divided by 50 gives me... I got 172.4. Is that correct? Yeah. And again, that answer as being my mean height, does that make sense? So how can I just kind of verify that it makes kind of sense? Well, look at how the frequency is here, right? Uh, very few people are 150 to 160. Very few, right? Uh, a couple more people are in the next category, 160 to 170. We have a lot more for the 170 to 180. So it actually kind of makes sense that most people would be in this category. It does actually make a little bit of sense, right? Um, and so for the answer to be 172.4, 
it seems pretty reasonable because we seem to have more people on the lower end than the higher end. We only have one really tall person, two people, two really tall people, right? So it would kind of make sense that this would be the average there. Does that make sense? And for the median, how do you find the median? So you have 50 people. So before we even get start doing the cumulative average, sorry, the cumulative frequency, let's figure out uh, which one will be in the middle. So we have 50 pieces of data. So the rule here is if it's an even number, you divide by 2. So that means that my middle value will be the 25th one. And of course, the rule is you go to the 25th one and the next one over if it's even. So that means that I'm looking between the 26th and the 25th one. So make sure it's on. So what value is between the 25th and the 26th one? Sorry, um, wait, sorry, we're looking for the one that's between that's between the 25th and the, the sorry, the mean of the 25th and the 26th one. So then what we're gonna do here is we're simply gonna keep adding the frequencies until we find the 25th one. So I'm gonna erase this here just so it doesn't get in the way. So a cumulative frequency, all you're doing is you're just adding the frequencies up to that point. So in the first one here, I'm gonna be adding seven and 13. I got a total of 20. And then if I add the 18 over here, what do I end up getting? 38. So you look at this and say, okay, up to here, I have the first 20 terms. And up to here, I have the first 38 terms. So that means that, so just using a little bit of logic, if I have had, if I record all the data, I would basically have 755s, 13, 165s approximately. And then I'm going to have a total of 18 of the 175s. So that means that my middle value, which is the 25th one, has to be in this category. Does that make sense? Because up to this point, we missed it already. So then that means that the next numbers that we're looking at, the 25th and the 26th one, they're going to have to be in this category. Does that make sense if I did that or no? Are you sure, guys? You can ask because it's actually it's not as easy as it. I feel like sometimes when I explain it, it doesn't make sense. I don't. I hope it's making sense. I have no idea um, because I remember when I, I I feel like I teach this and this does throw people off, right? All you're doing is you're just counting the frequencies until you get to the one that you want. So in this case, because I'm looking for the 25th and 26th one, I know it has to be in this category because uh, obviously I, I have if I include the whole entire category all the way through. I have a total of 38 pieces of data. So that means, if I'm not confusing you guys even more, so if I have seven of them here, and then I have 165, sorry, and then I have another 13 over here, I'm actually not gonna list them all off. I'm basically saying that I have a total of 20 pieces of data so far, so 20 terms. And then if I just keep going in this list, it would make sense that my 25th one would be in the next category of 175 as a midpoint, right? Because once I get to the very last one, which is at 38, I've gone too far. So it makes sense that my 25th and my 26th one would have to be in this category here. That's basically a visual way of illustrating that. So the so to find the, me, uh, the median, all we're doing is we're simply uh, estimating what it is just by looking at the cumulative frequency, which in this case would mean that it's between 170 and 180. This is the median. And keep in mind that normally we talk about one value for median. So instead of actually writing 170 to 180, just use the midpoint. What's the midpoint? 175 centimeters. Everyone understand this so far? Are you sure? Okay, perfect. All right, so now we get to the, the tech stuff, okay? Uh, so I just want to ex briefly explain how we use uh, Excel to kind of speed up our work a little bit. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'm going to turn on one light just because I feel like it might be a little bit hard to see sometimes. Do you guys still see it? Okay, 
Um, so I just want to go over a couple of the uh, commands that we have on Excel. So I know Mr. Edwards went over how to do a graph and charts on Excel. So I just wanted to just go over more the the stats part of it, just how to do the calculations. And again, this is something that also on the task we, that we have on Thursday, um, sorry, Friday, you guys are at home, so you definitely can use Excel to check your answer, right? So technically, you should be able to get perfect on this one, right? Because you do have resources, uh, you do have a way to actually calculate all the answers. But having said that, you need to show all the work, right? So as much as technology is great, you have to actually tell technology what you want it to do, right? That's the hard thing. So there is a way to kind of speed up the process here. So if you want to find the mean of your data, so I'm actually going to show you, instead of actually showing you on the handout, I obviously did the handout more for the cohort that's on here. But I'm just going to show you on Excel, it's probably easier. So I'm just going to make up some uh, fictional uh, numbers here. So if, let's say I have, so I'm just going to list off some numbers, 3, 4, 7, 3, sorry, 2, 4, 5, 8, 7, 1, randomly random numbers, okay. So I end up having these 10 pieces of data there. Let's say I want to find out what the mean is. So if I want to find the mean, all I do is I simply type in equals, so you have to write equals first before you actually do the calculations. And then I normally want to type in, like if you're looking for a command, you can actually start typing it. And what Excel does is it actually gives suggestions of ones that might match it up. Uh, unfortunately, mean is not one of the ones. It always throws me off. I always think mean is one of them. It's actually not mean, it's average. So on Excel, it shows up as average. Uh, so just kind of make sure. I think I wrote that down on the handout there. So then what you're going to do in this case is you're actually going to tell Excel, what am I finding the mean of? So if you want to find the mean of the numbers 3 all the way up to 4, you could technically write out 3, 4, 7, 2, 4, 5, 8, 1. That's really tedious, and especially if you have 100 pieces of data, you don't want to do that. So there's an easy way to do this. All you do is you simply say where it starts. So I say it starts at A1 and where it ends, which it ends at A10. So that's what we that's what we call cells in Excel. We name them off by their location. So if I'm looking at A1, I'm talking about this one here, and A10, I'm looking at this one here. So we say add A1 to A10, and it calculates my average. So my average is four. Does that make sense, guys? There. So there's an, another way to do this as well. Another way, instead of writing A1 to A10, if you're actually, and this is more for when you have more pieces of data, you can actually simply, let's say you want to add up, find the average of the whole entire column, you can actually just say, find the average of A to A, and it finds the average of the whole entire column. Except that, I just realized something, I can't do that if I'm actually in the column. So I have to move away from the column, even over here is fine. And I say average of A to A, and then that basically tells me find the average of that whole entire column. Does that make sense, guys? So there's a couple of ways to do it, but I personally, this is my opinion, I find it easier just to say where it starts, where it ends, right? So again, this will be really helpful for your for your task on Friday and, and also for your column data as well, right? So for your task, of course, show your work, but you have a resource, definitely use that, right? Like if you want to just check, like you're like, I don't actually know if it's right or not, you can definitely check on here, right? Um, but make sure you're always showing your work, right? Um, and it is good for you guys just to learn how to use this technology, right? Because this is actually something you're going to use in, in workplaces. It's really, really common now. Um, that's how everyone calculates all their averages, right? Um, the median. So let's go over median. Let's say I want to find the median. So you're going to type in median, and then you simply write A1 to A10. And again, what that does is it lists off, off it basically highlights all the values you're looking at. So, soon, so the good thing on Excel is that if you... If you're not sure if you click the right one, you'll know because it actually highlights the ones you're looking at. So it highlights it for me, click enter, and it's done. Make sense? Uh, if you're doing a frequency table, so that's the other last thing I want to talk about. Let's say that these are the frequencies of the values. I'm, I'm totally making this up. Let's say it's like 3, 4, 7, 
2 or something, right? I'm not going to show it for all of them. Let's say that this is the value over here, and this one right here, B, is a frequency. I probably should label it, but I'll just kind of show you really quick. If I want to actually take the value times the frequency, let's say I want to do that, it's a nice, easy command. All you have to do is simply say the cells that you have, and you put a little asterisk between them. That means multiply. So I want to multiply A1 times B1. And if I write A1 times B1, it basically tells me to multiply this one by that one. And again, nice thing about Excel, it, colors, it color codes everything for you. So you know you're doing it right or wrong. When you press Enter, and it multiplies the two numbers together. So obviously the other thing you can do is grab a calculator and calculate, right? But if you, and again, this is more for your culminating. If you end up getting a table and it's, it's written for some reason in a, in, or just in any sort of data, right? You're given a, a frequency table instead, and you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't actually want to, I don't know, sometimes you just don't want to do all the work of multiplying, adding it, all that. Um, you can do, you can put this command in there and it'll do it for you. And then the nice thing about this is like, let's say I want to do the same thing for 4 and 5, 7 and 7, and 2 and 2. And especially if the values actually end up changing later on, it makes it a lot easier for you to just drag this down and it does all the math there for you. So if I just click down and drag, it does all the calculations for you, right? Um, just a side note, not that it's relevant for your culminating or for your task, but this is amazing for, it's, how many of you, I think some of you said your parents have a small business, or maybe in the other cohort, I know. So if you have a small business, obviously a big part of your job is also just keeping records, right? Keeping payroll. The great thing about this is like, let's say that you're like, hmm, I am selling, I don't know, cookies for $7, like box of cookies for $7, right? So right now you say, okay, I sold seven boxes of cookies. But, and so your total is 49, right, that you made. But you don't want to be having to grab your calculator every single time that you do all the math. The nice thing about this is, like, you're, if someone's like, oh, I actually ended up selling 10 more, you're like, oh, you sold 10 more? Okay, perfect. So now you make $119, right? It's just really nice because you just put it in there. And, I, I mean, it seems really simple because, of course, you could use a calculator. I know I always say that. But it's just really nice that this actually kind of outlines everything there for you, right? All you really have to do, the hard thing is, coming up with the, the actual commands, you're, you're basically telling Excel what to do. But once you tell Excel what to do, it does it for you, right? It does all the calculations there. Any questions about it? No? Okay. And I forgot to mention one last thing. If you're wondering about the sum, how do you find the sum of it? And of course, you can use a calculator. But if you like, I don't know, I personally like making my life easy. You want to do the sum, you write C1, all the way up to C. If you write that, it adds all those numbers up for you. Um, this is, I'll tell you my tricks. As a teacher, I use Excel. That's how I calculate your marks, right? Because it, this seems really simple, and you're probably wondering, like, why can't you just grab a calculator? But I would have to do calculations for 20 of you, right? And imagine if I have a class of 34. I've had some really big classes. That takes a long time, right? Like, to have to do the math for every single one. And it's very, and the other thing for me is, I don't know, I have weird fingers. Sometimes when I press on the calculator, it just I press the wrong button. I don't know if you guys are the same way. It just, Excel is nice. It just, it, it outlines it for me. As long as it works well, I just make sure it's it's good. It's a good formula for all of them. And all I have to do is click and drag, and it does it all for me, right? It's really, really helpful. Just, yeah, big fan of Excel, especially the calculation there. All right, guys, uh, I think that is basically 